Well, thank you again, everyone, for being here. I'd like to welcome you. I'm Anna Gassman Pines. I'm a faculty member at the Duke Sanford School of Public Policy and a faculty affiliate of the Duke Center for Child and Family Policy. Um, before I start talking about our guest speaker for today, I just want to say a few things about logistics. Um, Dr. Kierenton will speak for about 40 minutes after which uh, we will open it up for questions and discussion for about 15 minutes. Uh, you may submit questions at any time via the chat function within Zoom and we'll just put them into a queue. So anytime you think of a question, please go ahead and just submit that right into the chat so we can make sure we get your question answered and include you in our discussion uh, for the last 15 minutes of today's talk. Thank you so much. Uh, the Early Childhood Initiative, established by the Duke Center for Child and Family Policy, seeks to bring together scholars to address challenges related to early childhood and produce world-class scholarship that helps maximize the potential of all children during the early childhood years. The Early Childhood Initiative seminar series speakers range across disciplines, but share an interest in bringing cutting-edge science to bear on policies affecting young children. And it is my great pleasure today to introduce our Early Childhood Initiative seminar speaker, Dr. Stephanie Curenton, tenured associate professor in the Boston University Wheelock College of Education and Human Development. Dr. Curenton studies the social, cognitive, and language development of low income and minority children within various ecological contexts, such as parent child interactions, early childhood education programs early childhood workforce programs and related state and federal policies. She was awarded a research policy fellowship from the Society for Research on Child Development and the American Association for the Advancement of Science and worked in the Office of Child Care. She has served on education nonprofit boards for the National Association for the Education of Young Children and local Head Start programs. Please join me in welcoming her to Duke today for her talk entitled Excellence for All Children, Ensuring Racial Equity in Early Childhood Classrooms. Hello, everyone. I'm so excited to be here to talk with you today. I'm going to dive right in. Um, just a there we go. So I have two goals for my presentation today. The first goal is to describe my research program. Very briefly, I will do that. And then I would like to spend the bulk of our time talking about the um, assessing classroom social cultural equity scale and talking about the validity of that scale. There we go. So my research and the tenacity and resilience of Black children and families. I look for and value the heterogeneity within this population. And I'm inspired by and even on a quest to understand what makes Black children thrive. And I'm so fortunate because I get to do that work now in um, under the auspice of my center that's called the Center on the Ecology of Early Development. This center was just launched this fall of 2020. And the mission of the center is to conduct applied equity focused research to inspire policy, policy leaders and pr practitioners to cultivate opportunities that optimize Black children's well being and ability to thrive. And if you click on the, um, the link, or um, you will see down here at the bottom, you'll be able to get more information about our initiatives and our staff, et cetera. So let's dive in. Oops. Okay. Well, let's dive into talking about access. So as I said earlier, I will talk with you about one project that we've spent a lot of time working on over the last few years. It's a measurement development project. And I wanted to develop a classroom observation tool that would give the field insight into what early childhood experiences are like for children of color, particularly those who have been racially marginalized. So you might be thinking, do we need a new measure? Um, what I what we know to be true is that within the early 
early childhood field. We have the classroom assessment scoring system, which is used widely and it's considered the gold standard of classroom quality. And it has been for about the past 12 years. Um, it's used as a program monitoring tool within Head Starts and with even within some state QIS systems. What's interesting is that the Head Start Act even requires that programs use class pre-K to monitor their program quality. So this is a really widely used tool and it's really sort of the only game in town when trying to measure process quality in the field. But like everything, the tools has its limitations. And one limitation is that while we know that class does in fact improve teacher practice, the predictive validity related to child's outcomes has been inconsistent. Another limitation is that it provides no information about racial equity, bias, or cultural responsiveness. So that led me to the journey of developing access. So the work on access began in February, 2016, when a team of us got together to work on a preschool version of the measure that's called the CASI, and that stands for Classroom Assessment of Social Cultural. Um, and what we were trying to do was operationalize and measure culture and how it operates within the classroom. But as, as I continued to work on that project with the team, I kept running into the difficulty with this idea of measuring culture across a diverse array of children within, the, within a classroom. And what I mean is in many school districts that are ethnically diverse, Latinx and black children are served together. And so there is sort of cross group diversity but also with in-group diversity among Latinx and Blacks. And so this makes it nearly impossible to operationalize which culturally based constructs to include in a measure. Um, however, as I continue to work on this and think about it, what I, um, what I understood was that despite these differences in cultural backgrounds, one thing that most of the children have is their lived experience of educational inequality. So the goal for access then morphed into developing a tool strong emphasis on equity while also recognizing social and cultural differences. So what are the, some of the inequities that RMLs have in common? So you know here, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir when I present this list of sort of the inequities that RMLs face in school. We know that they face disparity in resources, which we talk about as the opportunity gap. Um, they are more likely to be segregated into racially and financially segregated schools. They um, are taught a Eurocentric curriculum that's taught almost exclusively in English. Um, another problem with this curriculum is that often the curricula that they are um, exposed to has a limited focus on creativity or higher order thinking. These children also face um, teachers unconscious and implicit biases, their lowered expectations and disconnected relationships. And we know that they um, experience hard, harsher disciplinary actions. So given all of that and understanding the research literature around that, I started to think of how I could create a measure um, that looked at classroom quality from an anti-bias racial equity lens. And that is how we um, got the class. That was the rationale. So I wanna talk just a little bit about the development of it. So originally access had 71 indicators. And these indicators were created across what I call theoretical dimensions. And these theoretical dimensions were related to discipline, learning opportunities, peer collaboration, homeschool connection, and what I called a curriculum that challenges knowledge. And so as we move later in the presentation and I talk about the factor structure, I will specifically give you examples of um, the wording for each for these indicators. Um, and then I think another important thing that I can tell you about sort of the indicators 
is that um, the scoring for them ranges between a one to a five with the one meaning that we did not observe that behavior at all, and a five meaning that we observed it um, nearly all the time with nearly all the children. The data source for this work comes from a collaboration with our partners at the University of Virginia, um, Jessica and Mabel, who are the leaders in my teaching partner, Math and Science Intervention. And um, this intervention um, has access to, uh, well, I should say this at first, this intervention has nothing to do with equity. Um, and the intervention actually took place prior to the development of access. Um, but one of the reasons why we wanted to partner with them is because they have a lot of great data related to classroom videos as in all of the classroom videos they have have been scored for the class. Um, we have teacher demographic information and it also has a breadth of um, child outcomes. Another thing that I should tell you about the sample of videos is that the sample comes from primarily center-based public pre-Ks Head Start and Child Care Centers in Missouri and Kansas. And children were excluded from the sample if they had um, IEPs for severe developmental disabilities or if they had limited English proficiency. And the videos that we used um, consisted of the experimental and the control condition of this My Teaching Partner study. And um, there were, and over time, um, when we began to um, get the videos and code them for access, there was a group of about six of us over the course of 2016 until now, um, who were the primary coders for all of the videos that we have. And our standard of inter-rater reliability for the training of these videos is um, exact agreement um, during that initial phase of training. And then as we move on, when we were, um, once we are in the process of coding, um, our criteria for inter-rater reliability falls along the lines of Ch um, Cicchetti's 1994 ICC values of, of 4.40 being poor, 0 0.440 to 55 being fair, 0 0.60 to 74 being good, and 0.75 to one O being excellent. And what we find is that there's a range in our coding that um, goes from about 0.60 to 0.977 across the different dimensions. So the two studies that I'm gonna talk about today um, are answer the following questions. So in study one, the goal is to answer, is access related to classroom quality, specifically the class? And we're looking at convergent and divergent validity. And study two it questions, is access related to child outcomes? And in that one, we're looking at predictive validity. So um, what we're trying to do is one, determine the factor structure of access and its internal consistency. And we're also going to examine the convergent and divergent validity between access factors and the class for study one. The data for this study comes from 142 unique classroom observations that are nested within 52 classrooms slash teachers. Most of the teachers were white and had bachelor's degrees and they were lead teachers. Um, the teachers were observed multi across multiple observations with a range of between one to four observations and the average was about 2.73. Um, for, for, for this study as well as for the next one, um, teachers, um, at teachers access scores were averaged together. So when we are, look in the analyses, we're, um, we're looking at sort of one, an average of that teacher score. And just as a reminder, the class scores, they were scored by our colleagues at UVA who were completely blind to anything related to the access scores. And we actually, um, as we were coding for the access, we were completely blind to the class scores, meaning that we did not even look at the class scores for any of the videos until after we were finished coding. Oh, and just to tell you a little bit about the children in the classrooms, about half of the children were girls and the average family income to needs ratio was 1.90. And the average class was comprised of about 52% um, RMLs. And um, of those children, of the ethnicity of the children was mostly non-white, 
or racially minoritized kids who included Black, Latinx, Asian, and multiracial. And the children were between four and five years of age. So what do we find here? In terms of our access dimensions, we see that there's lots of variability across the different dimensions. So um, teachers ratings for personalized learning opportunities, which is down here at the bottom, was about 3.06. Um, um, we also see that connections to home life, um, the average score was about 1.57. Um, challenging status quo was also towards the lower end with about 1.93 equitable learning opportunities were towards the higher end about 3.82 and equitable discipline fortunately was towards the higher um, higher end as well so so first I want to tell you well I guess I should have done this slide um, I should have done this one first I'm sorry about this because the factors I want to tell you about the factor structure of um, what we found um, in the study and so we found those um, five factors which core um, core correspond to the, um, the descriptions about the dimension scores that I just shared with you. And the um, first factor was called challenging status quo knowledge. And you can see um, here is the alpha. And so the alpha, and so you'll see the alphas for each study, I mean, sorry, for each factor um, along here. And you can see the number of indicators that are in each factor as well as the title. So let me give you a few examples of the, some of the items that are in challenging status quo knowledge. So an example of an item in challenging status quo knowledge would be teacher affirms RML children's questions and encourages them to think more deeply. Um, another one would be teachers include storybooks and other materials that explore social justice and equity themes. An example of factor two, which is equitable learning opportunities would be um, that racially marginalized children are given the opportunity to ask and answer questions. And also that racially marginalized children are fully in integrated into the activities and, and um, of the classroom. Equitable discipline. Um, these were, um, this is an inverse, um, these are inverted scores, but we, for the factor structure, of course, we reverse them, which means that now um, if you have a higher score on equitable discipline, that means that you are more equitable. Um, but the items would be teacher uses over control with RML children, which, which stifles their behavior. Another um, item would be teacher reprimands um, RML children with a judgmental or harsh tone. So you can see for the wording for those, um, a higher score, you can see why it needs to be reverse scored because a higher score based on the item descriptions would not be a good thing, okay? And um, then we have connections to home life. And an example of connections to home life includes teacher provides opportunity for children to talk about their home life. The teacher um, talks about children's social identities and their family lives. And for personalized learning opportunities, um, examples include uh, teacher incorporates children's comments and reconnects them to lessons. And another one would be teacher waits for children to respond if they need more time formulating their verbal response. Right. And so the other thing that was really interesting about our factor structure is that we had originally had a lot of items that um, that we that we wanted to um, that theoretically we thought ranged into we thought grouped into um, a scale that's called peer interactions with RMLs. Unfortunately, those items did not load into our factor structure because in order to um, in order to code those items, the classrooms had to have both racially, racially marginalized and um, non-racially marginalized children. And some of our classrooms did and some of our classrooms did not. So what ended up happening is that we had a lot of um, sort of um, low, we had a lot of ones for that, um, for those items, which didn't give us the variability that we needed in order for those items to really load into the factor structure. But nevertheless, we um, included it in the paper um, with the items because we do think it's an important supplemental kind of scale. All right, so one of the things that people sort of always want to know is about this convergent 
and divergent validity. So it's the idea of how does access hang together with the class, the gold standard. So one we find for factor one, which is challenging status quo knowledge, that it was correlated with um, instructional learning formats on the class, and um, which shows that there's convergent validity in terms of that. In terms of equitable learning opportunities for RMLs, there was actually um, divergent validity because there were no um, significant correlations between that factor and any of the class scales. But in terms of equitable discipline, we find that there was a significant correlation between teacher sensitivity and equitable discipline, which we would hope and expect. For connections to home life, there was divergent validity, um, again, in the sense that these items were, this factor was not correlated with, um, with the dimensions or the domains of class. And then finally, for personalized learning opportunities, there were two um, dimensions of class that, were, um, that showed convergent validity. One was instructional support and the other was concept development. So I'm going to move into study two. And I want to tell you that the findings for study two are really hot off the press. So these are our preliminary findings that we um, were just ran last week, I think it was. And so I, um, I'm taking the risk to share these with you because I just, I think they're um, so interesting and I would love to sort of be able to just share them with people and get feedback and think about, um, think about things. Um, more. So the study, the purpose of study two was to determine the predictive validity of access for child outcomes related to math and social emotional skills, and to determine if classroom diversity, which we define as the percentage of RMLs within a class, moderated the association between access scores and child outcomes. And the way in which we define percentage of RMLs in the class is that a high, you were in the high group of percent of RMLs if your classroom had 50% or more, and then the low group, the classroom is described as a low group um, for classroom diversity if you had less than 50% of RMLs in the classroom. The method here, we have 105 children across 20 classrooms, um, or nested in 20 classrooms. Um, we have the classroom income needs to ratio here, which is um, 2.21. Um, so the interpretation of this um, income to needs ratio, just to be clear, is that an um, income to needs ratio of like 2.21 to one, which would mean um, that approximately these, the classroom was filled with on average children who were about 200% of the federal poverty level. And then the um, mean for the uh, class percent of RML was 0.43, which is really close to sort of how we split the groups. And then um, the outcomes that we're looking at are math outcomes, social competence and problem behavior, um, which is teacher report, um, and executive functioning um, penciled from pencil tap. And I should also say that the math, um, the ARS math assessment is also, um, is also a teacher report. Oh, there's one other thing I should tell you about this. The other thing when we talk about these 105 children is that these um, 105 children um, are target children across these different classrooms. So they're not, it's not an indication um, that every child within that classroom was test, was assessed. It's a sampling of children. And the sampling of those target children, um, they were about 50%, you know, on average between RMLs and non-RMLs. So, okay, let's look at the um, access dimension ratings again. And we see um, pretty similar kind of findings here in terms of the mean and the range. We have challenging status quo knowledge. The average score was about 1.76. 
for equitable learning, about 3.62, which means that these um, teachers are providing on average um, sort of more equitable learning opportunities. They're getting scores that are closer to sort of that high end range. Um, equitable discipline, 4.53, which also indicates that sort of um, overall on average, we are seeing more equitable discipline, um, challenging status quo, again, I'm mean, sorry, um, connections to home life was again towards the lower end with 1.69 and personalized learning opportunities were somewhere right in the middle with 2.97. So again, we see the range in terms of um, the access to interventions. So the first research question um, that we wanted to look at in terms of child outcomes for this study was looking at our equitable social cultural interactions positively associated with children's math, executive functioning, and social competence, and negatively associated with children's problem behavior. So one of the things that I can say is that um, all of the, um, there were no significant findings for the outcome variable of problem behavior, but we did have significant findings for um, outcomes related to math, executive functioning, and social competence. And I should mention that all of these models controlled for condition, um, the experimental versus control condition. They controlled for family um, income needs ratio, gender, and, um, and the classroom income needs to ratio was also included in the, into the model. And these were nested models because children are nested within the classrooms. Um, the other thing that, um, the, the fact that we did find that um, access scores were related to child outcomes was really exciting for us because remember, I had talked to you about how um, the, the predictive validity of class is sometimes um, inconsistent. And there's a new paper that just came out in 2020 by Guerrera Rosado, in which they found that class scores were not related to any of their child outcomes. And they were doing, um, doing a study that was conducted in the Boston Public Schools and the pre-K program in Boston. So it's very encouraging that we actually do have some um, child outcomes, some association with child outcomes. And what you can see specifically is the dimension of challenging status quo knowledge was positively associated with math scores. Um, equitable learning opportunity was negatively correlated, which means that when teachers engaged in with, engaged more with RMLs, the, they had lower math scores for the target children in that class which is really interesting. It's not sort of what we would have expected, but it could be related to the function of um, uh, if teachers are engaging more with RMLs, it could um, mean that there are more RMLs in the classroom. And so that's related to um, the association between um, RMLs and lower math scores. But the second question will give you information about that. Um, we also find a pop, um, positive association between equitable discipline in math, in terms of equitable, um, in terms of executive functioning, again, we see a negative correlation, negative, uh, sorry, negative um, association between equitable learning opportunities and executive functioning. We see a positive um, uh, association between uh, personalized learning opportunities and um, connections to home life. And then also we see that challenging status quo knowledge, predicted social competence, and connections to home life also positively predicted social competence. So for question two, we wanted to look at, this question was motivated by the fact of, we wanted to see whether or not um, the composition of the classroom um, had can moderate this relationship between um, between um, um, access scores and child outcomes. And the reason why we thought that this was important to look for is that we would think that as the classroom became more diverse, um, teachers would use more access sort of skills and strategies. And also that um, if you were a child in a classroom with more RMLs, 
the fact that the teacher would use these um, higher strategies might be even more important for you, for you and your learning. So we wanted to sort of look at that, whether or not there was a, a moderating effect. And what we found is that there was for math in the sense that um, equitable learning opportunities um, was, there was an interaction between equitable learning, um, um, equitable discipline and the percentage of students in um, RML classrooms and um, challenging, challenging connections to home life as well. What, there was an interaction between classroom percent of RMLs and personalized learning opportunity as well. Um, there was an interaction between classrooms uh, percent of RMLs. We find um, also significant interactions for social competence and for problem behavior. And so just to remind you again, when, I, when we're saying class percentage of RMLs, we're talking about classrooms where 50% or more of the children are RMLs, and those RMLs can include Black, Latinx, um, Asian Pacific Islanders, et cetera. And the classrooms with lower RMLs means that there's less than 50% of um, RMLs in that classroom. So in those classrooms, um, they are um, predominantly um, white, but not exclusively, but not exclusively. So let me interpret some of these interactions. All right, so in terms of math scores, what we see here is that there is a, that classroom percentages of RMLs moderated the relationship between connections to home life and math scores. In that, math scores were higher overall when children were in classrooms with more RMLs. Um, and when teacher scores on um, connections to home life were low, children in classrooms with higher RMLs were better than those in classrooms with lower RMLs. And this difference was exacerbated when um, connections to home life was high. Those children who were in classrooms with more RMLs had teachers who used more, and had teachers who used more connections to home life actually had the highest math scores. Um, but the, the children in classrooms with lower um, RMLs or fewer RMLs and teachers who had high, um, higher connections to home life actually had lower math scores. And so um, we don't exactly know why yet, but some of that speculation could be because in those lower, in those classrooms with lower RMLs, teachers could, um, could mostly be talking to um, say um, the white children and not necessarily talking so much to the kids of color. We don't know. Also, in terms of personalized learning opportunities, we see that when personalized learning opportunity was low, children in the classrooms with fewer RMLs did better in math compared to those in classrooms with many RMLs. Um, but the exact opposite was true when teachers were in high, had high personalized learning opportunity scores. And in this case, those children in more racially diverse classrooms, meaning those high, um, with their, where there's a high class percent of RMLs, um, they have better math scores. And those in less racially diverse classrooms did worse than math. Another one for math that we see, which is really interesting again, is that um, children in classrooms with more RML, RMLs had better math scores. And these scores were pretty consistent regardless of the, um, the uh, level of equitable discipline that was happening in the classroom. But children who were in less racially diverse classrooms and classrooms with lower scores on equitable discipline actually had the worth worst math scores um, of all. But this was completely flipped when in a classroom with higher equitable discipline. So in that case, those children in the less racially diverse classrooms performed equally as well as those in the highly diverse classrooms. And when we talk about social competence, we see that again, we have this crossover interaction. And here, what we see is that when um, connections to home life was low, 
um, but children were in less diverse classrooms, their social skills were actually better. But quite the opposite is that when children were in more racially diverse classrooms and the teachers um, um, challenging, um, the teacher's connections to home life was low, these children had the worst social confidence. And this is changed when teachers were in high, where teachers were high on connections to home life. So in this case, those teachers in more diverse classrooms had better, those children, I'm sorry, in more diverse classrooms had better social skills, um, but those in less diverse classrooms had worse social skills. And the last one for problem behavior is that we see that when um, equitable learning opportunities were low and teachers were in highly diverse classrooms, children had more problem behaviors. Compared to when children were in classrooms with teachers who provided low equitable learning opportunities and less racially diverse classrooms. When teachers provided more equitable learning opportunities and children were in classrooms with more RMLs, their behavior problems drastically decreased. So you can see from the blue line. And <clears throat> problem behaviors also decreased when teachers provided more equitable learning opportunities, even in those classrooms where um, that were less diverse. So to highlight um, these findings, we find that um, the access has a five factor structure plus a supplemental scale. We know that challenging status quo knowledge, equitable discipline and personalized learning opportunities show convergent validity with class, but there's also divergent validity in terms of um, equitable learning opportunities for RMLs and connections to home life. We also learned um, in study two that access dimensions actually do predict child outcomes, but that the racial composition of children's classrooms moderates the association between access scores and child outcomes. So overall, a takeaway from study two is that it actually does matter who is in the room. And so future work, we are continuing to develop um, the access tool. And there is a, um, another sort of uh, version of it that I would think to call it that we call access snapshot. And that um, version focuses on teachers interactions with individual RMLs um, and the individual RMLs experience within that classroom. So for the, um, the access, the one I, uh, told you about today, we call that the Access Global. And for that one, it looks at sort of overall, how is the teacher um, engaging with the, R with the um, RMLs like overall in the classroom? But the Access Snapshot will allow us to look at individual children, how the teacher is engaging with individual RML children. So we're really excited about that. Um, we're also interested in developing this, um, what we call Access Voice. And access voice um, would be used to examine um, what we can think of as linguistic ex um, equity in the classroom, such as looking at code switching, use of home language, looking at sort of racial discourse, and also how teachers use um, criticism um, in the classroom. And we are in the process now of publishing the access manual, and we are, in, we are developing a mechanism for online training for raters to become reliable and certified for more of them to become reliable and um, certified. And my ultimate um, takeaway point is sort of just a lot of hope. Um, I'm just so inspired by this work and energized by it. And it's my hope that access will be used by both practitioners and early childhood leaders. And in terms of practitioners, I'm hoping that it will actually change teaching practices by building the workforce's capacity to engage in equitable social cultural interactions. And in terms of our system leaders and our policy makers, I'm really hoping that it will inspire ideas for system frameworks and guidance about around creating early childhood systems um, from P through third grade that are really more equitable. And this is an acknowledgement to our 
um, entire um, access team um, who has been working on this project at various points since um, 2016. And I always like to um, joke and say that it takes a village to create an access tool. And this is our village. And thank you. And I will take any questions. And I think I'm going to stop screen sharing now. I should have plenty of time. Well, thank you so much for that really, really interesting talk. It was just great to hear about this work. I know it's been um, a <clears throat> substantial undertaking, a multi-year undertaking, and uh, it's just it's really fantastic to see um, kind of the fruits of all of that labor for you and your team. Um, so uh, we have some questions coming into the chat. I'm gonna start, but I also just wanna continue to encourage folks in the audience to uh, go ahead and put questions for Dr. Kierington in the chat and, and I will share those with her. Um, but can we, uh, could we start, there, there are questions, if you could just help us back up a little bit and think through this um, concurrent and divergent validity findings. So, I mean, one big takeaway, it seems, is that your access tool is really measuring something distinct from what the class is measuring, which, um, uh, you know, is, is really crucially important. But could you kind of help us think through uh, where those differences really are and kind of what they help us understand about classroom processes? Right, right. So the reason we were looking at convergent and divergent validity specifically is because we wanted to see what are the ways in which access is similar to um, class and what are the ways in which it's um, different, right? And the ways in which it's different, the ways in which we have divergent validity are the uniqueness. They represent the uniqueness of, um, of access. And so one of the things, um, I think the question was sort of, you know, where is the overlap? Right, And so we see that there's overlap in what is called, what we call challenging status quo knowledge and what class um, describes as instructional learning formats. And so I'll tell you just a little bit about um, how class describes um, instructional learning formats. They say that these focus on the ways the teacher sort of maximizes students' interests, their engagement and their ability to learn um, such as effective um, facilitation using a variety of modalities and student interests. And so when you see, when you hear their description, you can see how there are certain um, similarities and um, in our uh, challenging status quo knowledge, such as, you know, teachers are including storybooks and materials that explore social justice. Teacher encourages children to think about how they can help others, right? And then for the next um, uh, factor that we had in access with equitable learning opportunities for RMLs, there, that showed divergent validity. And that showed that access is actually measuring something different than class does, which you would expect because in that, um, in that factor or dimension, um, it is particularly focused on how the teacher is providing learning opportunities for racially marginalized kids. So it's asking the raters to look at the racially marginalized kids in the classroom. There's nothing in the class that ever asks you to do that. So we would expect there to not be any type of correlation, you know, in that aspect. In terms of equitable discipline, what we see is an overlap between um, teacher sensitivity and, um, and the access thing of ex equitable discipline. I'm glad that we see that. I'm sure the class people are glad that we see that because um, the idea is that you sensitive teachers will be more equitable. I'm sure that is their I, like that is their original I, intent and description. It's just that the class um, doesn't actually call it out. They don't actually call out in um, inequitable discipline the way that we do. Um, but it is good that we see convergent validity there. In terms of connections to home life, Again, it's divergent validity because in this aspect of what we do with access, we were really trying to um, pull from that literature, um, that culturally responsiveness literature that is really about how does the teacher sort of allow children to bring in their identities and their stories, et cetera, into the classroom. Again, there's divergent validity with the class because the class doesn't do that. They haven't thought about doing that, right? And then for personalized learning opportunities, these are things that are really about um, 
again, we said teacher incorporates children's comments and reconnects them to the lesson. Um, teacher provides instructional um, content across a range of auditory, visual, and movement opportunities. So that's some of the things, that's some of the items that we consider for personalized learning opportunities. And with instructional support, I um, read the, for, um, for class, that is really about sort of how teachers um, provide uh, feedback loops, language sort of feedback loops um, in conversations, how they answer, how they ask children how and why questions. And also concept development is similar to how they sort of really push children to dig deeper in terms of their thinking. So again, we would expect there to be convergent validity between these two aspects because our personalized learning opportunities um, capture a lot of the things that are similar to what class is interested in, in terms of um, instructional support and conceptual concept development. So it's actually good. I mean, I just, I wanna say it's, it's actually good that we have convergent and divergent validity across different things because you want, because you can imagine it as though there are some ways in which access and class overlap and there's some ways in which they're unique. That was super helpful. Thank you so much. Um, Another question that's been raised is um, <clears throat> whether you have any information about the types of professional development that the teachers were getting specifically around kind of uh, implicit bias or culturally relevant pedagogy or kind of restorative justice or any of the you know different types of professional development that might have been offered to teachers, mm -hmm. um, whether you have any information about that and then also whether that's linked to how they uh, are engaging with diverse students in their classrooms. Mm -hmm. So we do have some information because we were, we had that information from the My Teaching Partner um, study. And as I had mentioned before, these teachers um, either and in the control and experimental condition, they were given no PD around equity, racial justice, culturally responsiveness, nothing like that. So what we really wanted to do um, with these, we wanted the fact, we wanted to sort of get a, um, I don't know how to describe it, sort of a, a population of teachers who had not had any professional development. We're trying to get a sense of what is happening sort of in the world naturally without the intervention of some type of professional development around racial um, equity and justice. So these teachers had had nothing. And, um, and a question though that we have for the future and for our work as we continue to sort of develop this out and start to think about even interventions, et cetera, is what actually does happen when teachers are given specific PD around racial justice and cultural responsiveness and um, equity issues, et cetera. So we're very much interested in this idea of can PD sort of change these things? Can PD make, um, make these things um, better? better. And it's really, you know, it's definitely one of our interests and passions because the recent book that we wrote called Don't Look Away, um, anti-bias, um, embracing anti-bias uh, classrooms, um, that whole book is about sort of getting teachers to think about issues of racial equity and social justice. And so, you know, so our idea is sort of that if if we have a teaching population who receives, who receives PD around these issues that I would predict and expect their access scores to get better, I would hope. Um, yeah, thank you so much. Um, it also, I think, connects to a um, broad conversation we're having in higher education as well. And whether you know there are ways that we as um, teachers within higher education can do a better job of engaging in uh, equitable ways with diverse students. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so a, a couple more questions coming into the chat. Let's see. Um, uh, so can you talk a little bit more about the sample of schools that were in this My Teaching Partner um, study? I know you, you set it up a little bit at the beginning, but could you just say a little bit more about kind of uh, how they ended up being in the study, where they are, and um, you know, kind of as we're just imagining, who are the kids in these classrooms? Uh, it, you know, a little bit more context would be would be really helpful. Okay, great. So the children were, um, as I said, they were uh, four and five year olds from either center-based public pre-K, Head Start, or child care centers that were located in Missouri or Kansas, and. Um, 
their sampling framework um, excluded children if they had severe developmental disabilities right. or if they had link, limited English proficiency. And um, the, these classrooms were randomly assigned to an experimental versus a control um, condition. Right. And I should say like, you know, I had no control over any of that. <laughs> like this <laughs> data that we got, I had no control over any of that that happened, yeah. But nevertheless, even though, uh, you know, we here sitting in North Carolina might be imagining in Kansas and Missouri, uh, particularly homogenous classrooms, you're actually showing us that uh, there actually, uh, they there were many classrooms that were quite diverse. And in fact, some classrooms that included largely uh, racially marginalized young people. Yes. Yeah. yes, 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 of course, of course. Yes, right. there, I mean, and yes, that is very true. There's diversity you know, everywhere across all of our states. And especially when we're thinking about sort of the population, when remember that the income to needs ratio um, of our classrooms was right around sort of 200% of the federal poverty level. And so the way that our country is set up, unfortunately, is that it's one in which um, there is more racial diversity um, in the lower economic um, uh, uh, income ranges within our country. So we would be able to find more diversity, you know, even in Kansas and Missouri. Right, right. Um, in your second research question, um, looking at the student outcomes, um, the, can you just help us clarify and then take a step back and think through, the, these are outcomes for uh, all students, not just racially marginalized students. Is that, that's right. Uh, and so help us, think through the implications then of what it means, for example, to be in a highly diverse classroom with a teacher that is um, uh, teaching in a more equitable way. Yeah, yeah. So I would say just a, a big takeaway is that what does it mean is that mostly all of our um, interactions, what we found is that if you are in a um, highly, uh, a classroom that is more racially diverse, right? And the teacher is engaging in more access sort of skills and or, you know, dimensions, then that's a benefit. It's a positive thing, right? you know, um, for you. Now, and it's a positive thing for you, um, regardless of your, um, your own personal background, because this is where it gets like crazy, it's even, it's even maddening for me, is that the, the outcome measures that we have are based on a random sample of between five to six target children within each classroom. And as I said, those target children were pretty much split between being some type of racially marginalized learner and some type of non, and, and a white learner. Um, so, so even when we're, so yeah, so um, so we can't say, for example, but but what I want to know, what I, what I want to know, and I think maybe what this other person wants to know is sort of for each child specifically, if you are a racially marginalized child specifically, and you're in a classroom with more racially um, marginalized children, does that make your scores better, right? Right now, we just know that if you are any type of child, in a high in a racially mar, in a more diverse classroom and your teacher is engaging in um, high access sort of skills it benefits you right but but I want to know that second part um, or that first part that I mentioned but the but even as I say that too we also have to realize that what we actually have is actually quite interesting and actually quite powerful because what it's actually showing is that these practices these racially equitable practices, can actually help everybody. It doesn't just help the racially marginalized kids. But we, but I want to go through and actually tease that out, you know, a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one, I guess, more comment in the comments uh, uh, specific to the study of class scores in Boston is just encouraging us all to think a little bit about kind of the restricted range of class scores, the possibility that. Uh, Boston Pre-K, which is generally considered to be a quite high quality program um, with a lot of coaching and support for teachers that it may be that um, uh, if you if you can get all your classrooms to a plate to, you know, some relatively high quality threshold, 
uh, then you won't, you know, you won't have a whole lot of variability to be predicting ch mm -hmm. uh, child outcomes. One could imagine working towards a similar thing with, uh, with your very important scale and trying to encourage every classroom to be meeting, you know, a high standard of equitable um, teaching practices, right? And then if that if that meant then that there was no longer uh, variation to use to correlate with student outcomes, that might actually be a good a good outcome for uh, for children's uh, learning and development ultimately. Yeah, no, I I uh, completely agree, and I. I think that you know, I don't remember 100%, but I think that there was some variability in the class scores in that BPS study. There were, there actually was some. Um, and the other thing that I would say is that, um, hmm, I kind of lost my train of thought. Oh, the other thing that I thought and wondered as I was reading this is that I thought I would love to be able to see how access relates to children's um, score, their outcome scores when we look at these classrooms. Because what we know about Boston, I live in Boston now, what we know about Boston is that there, um, there's a huge uh, gap, a huge achievement gap between sort of our white and our non-white you know, children. And so if, if all of these moderation sort of effects that we have here, if they're true and if they operate in other contexts, then to be in a high quality BPS school using the focus on curriculum and implementing it with fidelity, plus having a teacher who's trained in access and, um, and doing that well, it could actually mean that the children of color do better, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's exciting to think about those, you know, kind of career guiding projects like that could be, you know, you've just laid out a really important research agenda, I think for, you know, for the next several decades. <laughs> Um, there are a couple more questions in the chat, but I do want to be mindful of the time. And in particular, before we um, close, uh, two, two quick announcements. Um, one is we are always uh, trying to improve our events and uh, the quality of these events. And as we all adjust to this new reality of having things be virtual, we would really love your feedback. Um, about this event and how we can do better. There is a link to a very brief feedback survey in the chat and we hope each of you will just take a couple minutes um, to fill that out. We would be so, so appreciative of that. Um, and the second thing that I just want to highlight that's also in the chat, um, uh, but I do want to highlight for everyone here is that we will be welcoming uh, Raj Chetty from Harvard um, as our next Sulzberger Distinguished Lecturer. He'll be joining us um, virtually on December 8th, and you can look for more information um, about Dr. Chetty's talk uh, linked in the chat as well. Um, Dr. Kierington, if you're able to stay for a couple more minutes, maybe people who didn't get their questions answered could just uh, informally hang around for a moment. Um, but I hope you will all join me in uh, thanking Dr. Kierington for a really, really interesting and wonderful talk today. And this will conclude um, the formal portion of our session. Thank you all so much for being here.